One of the biggest health crises in the world is the obesity epidemic. Obesity is one of the biggest risk factors for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration, cancer and kidney disease. Today there are over 1.9 billion overweight and over 650 million obese people across the globe, which equates to 52% of the world's population being above normal weight. That's pretty crazy if you think about it. It means that there are more people who are overweight or obese than those who are normal weight. There is no healthy obesity when you compare it to being normal weight and being metabolically healthy or fit. In this video, I'm going to share with you my evidence-based weight loss routine that helps me to stay lean without counting calories, without restricting any foods, without spending many hours at the gym and without feeling hungry. You'll also hear commentary from Dr. James DeNicola Antonio, who's a cardiovascular research scientist and doctor of pharmacy from the US. James and I have co-authored one of the best-selling books on weight loss on Amazon called The Obesity Fix. Obesity is definitely one of the top causes of early death, not just in the Western world, but but globally, and obviously it's something that's easily preventable. First, let's talk about what has led to the exponential rise in obesity in the US and other Western countries. The biggest and most obvious reason for the rise in obesity is the rising access to calories and reduced physical activity. There's a direct correlation between higher calorie intake, sanitary behavior, and the prevalence of obesity. In the US, mean calorie intake increased from 1,955 in the 1970s to 2,269 during 2003. Today, Americans consume up to 3,000 1,600 calories per day. But what are these people eating to reach those high numbers? You have an increase in liquid calories, particularly sugar-sweetened beverages, uh, sodas, fruit juices, things like that. Um, also an increase in refined carbohydrates, refined grains, also added fats. So not just um, seed oils, but things like things that are high in fat as well, like cheese um, in the forms of pizza. So a lot of processed food increased, fast food increased. So there's really a plethora of things that are driving the overconsumption of calories. In the early 19th century, processed and ultra-processed foods, specifically the ones that contain sugar, white flour, and vegetable oils, comprised less than 5% of people's food intake, whereas in 2019, it had risen up to 60%. The ultra-processed foods, like pizza or chips, have significantly more calories than their natural counterparts. For example, 100 grams of french fries or potato chips has up to 500 calories, whereas 100 grams of regular baked potatoes has only 75 calories. The reason for such a stark difference is because the potato chips and fries are cooked in oils that increase the calorie content exponentially. So there isn't one single food group or ingredient that's solely responsible for the obesity epidemic. People just don't eat too much sugar or too much fat. They eat all of those things in too large quantities. Simply replacing the ultra processed food with whole foods can lead up to a 500 to 600 calorie deficit. And so obviously that's a that's an easy way to get to a lower caloric intake in someone's diet. When we're talking about calories, it's important to realize that they just refer to the amount of energy stored in a particular food. Your body doesn't count calories. There is no calorie counter inside the body. However, your body does have an energy balance and calories from food affect your energy balance. The average woman is recommended to eat 1,600 to 2,400 calories a day and a man 2,000 to 3,000 calories. However, the actual calorie requirements vary a lot between individuals, depending on body weight, muscle mass, and physical activity. You don't need to count calories to lose weight. I haven't been counting calories for the last 8 to 10 years, but whenever you are losing weight, you're in a negative energy balance, whether you realize it or not, which doesn't always reflect in the amount of calories you eat. And if you're gaining weight, then you're in an energy surplus, which is affected by many things besides food. For weight loss, it's generally recommended to aim for about a 500 calorie deficit per day, which is quite moderate and sustainable. Your body's energy balance is reflected in the total daily energy expenditure or TDEE. Here's what your total daily energy expenditure consists of. Resting metabolic rate or RMR. This describes how many calories your body is burning to stay alive without doing anything. Your resting metabolic rate makes up 60 to 70 percent of your total daily energy expenditure. So when we're talking about weight loss, you know, really what you want to focus on is fat loss. A lot of people sort of think, you know, doing a lot of cardio is the best way to burn fat. Fat. But the easiest way to burn fat is to burn fat in your sleep. And the best way to do that is to build muscle. Muscle literally burns more calories 
doing nothing. I measured my resting metabolic rate a few months ago and it told that it's 3,300, which is quite high. And combined with other things, my metabolic rate is up to 5,000 calories a day, which is very high. On average, my daily calorie intake is somewhere between 2,500. And on some other days, it's up to 3,500. This means that I maintain a moderate calorie deficit for most of the days and is also the reason why I'm able to stay very lean year round. The second component of our TDE is exercise activity thermogenesis or EAT, which describes how many calories are burned during deliberate exercise. It only makes up 0 to 10% of your total daily energy expenditure because most people don't exercise any longer than an hour. Successful weight loss maintainers have been seen to have higher levels of physical activity, which suggests they maintain energy balance through increased movement. The third component of your TDE is non-exercise activity thermogenesis or NEAT. This describes all the spontaneous movements such as walking, washing the dishes, house chores, fidgeting, etc. For most people, NEAT makes up about 20% of total daily energy expenditure, which is much higher than exercise. However, the amount of energy spent on NEAT can vary greatly between individuals. The difference can be thousands of calories. I'm pretty sure you've seen people who are hyperactive and moving all the time. They have a very high level of NEAT. And because of that, they also tend to be slimmer and thinner because they burn so many calories every day. A low NEAT is associated with obesity because of low energy expenditure and being sedentary. When you restrict calories, that meat goes down. So you don't move as much. Your body kind of tries to conserve energy. And so automatically your movements will go down. Modern societies are already characterized by very low levels of NEAT. Most people work behind a desk all day, they commute while sitting in a car, and at home they sit in front of a TV or computer. They might exercise for only one hour a day, but remember that only contributes to 10% of their total daily energy expenditure. So if you're just exercising one hour per day and at other times you're sitting, then yes, you're not really burning that many calories because your NEAT is very low. By incorporating more scheduled or deliberate NEAT, such as going for walks every day, making sure that you get a certain amount of steps every day, you can achieve a greater calorie deficit. A 2023 meta-analysis saw that walking 8,700 steps a day compared to 2,000 steps a day was seen to be linked to a 60% reduction in risk of all-cause mortality. Taking 16,000 steps per day resulted in an additional 5% reduction in risk of all-cause mortality. So, walking up to 16,000 steps a day yields the greatest reduction in mortality risk. And, for weight loss, the more steps you take, the greater your need, the more calories you burn, and the easier it is going to be to lose weight. Walking is literally the most underrated form of exercise and the most underrated way to lose weight. I personally walk around 12,000 steps per day because it's good for health, but also helps to maintain low body fat percentage. The fourth and last component of our TDE is the thermic effect of food. This describes the amount of calories spent on digesting what you eat. Protein has the highest thermic effect of food of 20 to 30 percent, carbs 7 to 15 percent, alcohol 15 percent, and fat 2 to 4 percent. Higher protein foods are more satiating as well. So there's kind of two benefits to eating high protein, both the fact that it requires more calories to digest it, but also it has a higher satiety index. If you had two identical diets with the same amount of calories, but one of the diets had more protein, then that diet would result in greater weight loss because your body would burn more calories digesting that protein. One 2012 randomized clinical trial showed exactly that. They had two diet interventions, both prescribed a 500 calorie deficit, but one group ate 1.6 grams per kilogram per day of protein, and the other one ate 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. After 12 months, the high protein group lost more body fat than the low protein group. In a 2021 meta-analysis of 37 randomized controlled trials, a protein intake ranging from 18 to 59 percent of total calories was found to be effective for body weight management, especially among individuals with prediabetes. People eating more protein also report greater satiety and less hunger after meals. A 2020 meta-analysis of 49 randomized controlled trials found that even acute consumption of protein suppresses appetite at a protein amount of less than 35 grams. At doses over 35 grams, protein reduces gradually in the hunger hormone and increases glucagon like peptide 1 or GLP1, which is a gastrointestinal peptide that reduces blood sugar levels and decreases appetite. GLP1 is what weight loss medicines like Ozempic and Sebaglutide work upon. One of the best ways to reduce hunger throughout the day is to get somewhere between 30 and 50 grams of protein per meal. 30 grams of protein, essentially, you're talking about like one and a half hamburgers 
or one egg is six grams of protein. So you can have like three to four eggs in the mor morning with a couple ounces of steak will give you between 30 and 50 grams of protein. And then foods like cottage cheese, Greek yogurt are also higher in protein as well. A lot of people get this wrong that nuts are high in protein and actually they're more higher in fat. So you just got to be careful with that. But fish is also a good source of protein as well, seafood. When keeping in mind the idea that muscle mass increases your resting metabolic rate, then it's also important to eat enough protein to support muscle growth. Resistance training is the number one determinant of muscle growth, but you also need protein for that. Overall total protein intake, um, somewhere between 1.6 and 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight is optimal for muscle protein synthesis. If you're in a caloric deficit that can even go up to 3.3 meal frequency is another interesting topic nutritionists have been saying for decades that you need to eat six small meals a day to prevent metabolic slowdown and to prevent weight gain however human clinical trials on intermittent fasting have found that it's an effective strategy for weight loss without counting calories a 2023 meta-analysis of seven randomized controlled trials found that those following time restricted eating with calorie restriction saw greater reductions in body weight fat mass and waist circumference compared to just calorie restriction. However, those effects were seen because the people following time restricted eating were also in a greater calorie deficit because they subconsciously ate less calories. Multiple randomized clinical trials from 2022 and 2023 have shown that when calories are equated, intermittent fasting is effective for weight loss, but it's not superior to regular calorie restriction when the calories are the same. So intermittent fasting can be very effective for controlling your calorie intake and also losing weight. It's just not going to be magic. So you shouldn't feel the obligation that you need to have like one meal a day or two meals a day to lose weight. But if it suits you, then that's very good. The way I do it is I have two protein meals per day, one protein shake giving me about 30 to 40 grams of protein. And then the second meal after my workout that gives about 100 grams. So in total, I get around 130 grams of protein per day. My first snack of the day is 30 grams of whey protein and 10 grams of collagen for the muscle growth and skin anti-aging benefits. It's what fuels my workout. Whey protein supplementation has been seen to promote muscle growth. Whey protein also optimizes body fat loss during weight loss by preserving muscle tissue. And whey protein also reduces both short-term and long-term appetite. This makes whey protein an amazing addition to someone's diet as a meal replacement or to top up your daily protein intake. The brand of whey protein I'm using, Nordcode, has whey from grass-fed cows from the Alps. It's the cleanest whey protein in the world. Nordcode also has complete collagen with added glycine, magnesium with six different types of magnesium, and C8 MCT oil that increases your metabolic rate and promotes fat burning. You can get a 10% discount with the code SEAM10 at livehealthy.com forward slash collections forward slash Nordcode with two O's. A very controversial topic online is low carb versus high carb diets. You have both groups of people saying that their diet is the best for weight loss. But which one is it? Well, the truth is you can lose weight on any kind of a diet as long as you're in a calorie deficit. Which one is more optimal is obviously a different question. Many people who promote low carb diets claim that restricting carbohydrates carbohydrates is superior to eating carbs. They say low carb gives a metabolic advantage because of keeping insulin levels low. Insulin is called a fat storage hormone, but that's not really true. Insulin does reduce fat burning, but you can store body fat even with low insulin levels, especially if you exceed your daily energy requirements. In metabolic ward studies where people are fed exactly the same amount of calories and their entire food intake is calculated, we find that there is no difference in weight loss between low carb and high carb low fat diets. It really should be based on your activity level. Carb, carb intake. So the, the more active you are, the more muscle mass you have, you will do better both from, you know, an activity level, energy level, but also performance level by consuming more whole food carbohydrates. Low carb diets do tend to work for the majority of people in regards to losing weight because it's a, sim a simple way to cut out processed carbs. You're lowering one of the main contributors of foods that can tribute to obesity, refined carbs and sugar. So simply going low carb is lowering, you know, majority of foods that cause people to overeat because they have a low satiety index and you end up eating more protein and more fiber, which is more satiating anyway. So while it does lower insulin levels and there is some benefit there as well, you're really getting rid of you know, classes of foods that contribute to an increased caloric intake. I've done both low carb and high carb diets. For me, a high carb diet works better. My workouts are better. I build more muscle. I have higher muscle strength and my blood work is also better. I actually lost body fat eating more carbohydrates. On average, I eat around 200 to 250 grams of carbs per day and I'm still able to lose weight if I want to. My blood work regarding lipids, blood sugar and inflammation is also great. I did a recent blood work and my fasting 
fasting blood sugar was 89.9 milligrams per deciliter, which is good. My fasting insulin was 3, which is also good. And my hemoglobin A1c, which reflects the average blood sugar over the past few weeks, was 5%, which is also good. I've tracked my blood sugar with a continuous glucose monitor, and the average blood sugar on all days is around 88 to 90, which is great. So for me, eating more carbohydrates works, but it works because I'm still in a moderate calorie intake and I'm not overeating calories. But at the end of the day, you have to find what works for you, which diet are you able to adhere to the best. Restricting carbs might backfire in weight maintenance if you restrict the intake of fibrous vegetables and other low calorie plant foods. There's a lot of evidence indicating that a high fiber intake promotes weight loss and maintaining a lower body weight. People eating more fiber have been seen to have a lower BMI. That's because of the higher satiety and suppressed appetite of higher fiber intake. The polyphenols in fibrous vegetables have also been seen to increase the expression of GLP-1, which promotes satiety and lower blood sugar. A 2021 controlled feeding trial saw that a low-fat, higher-carb diet resulted in 500 to 700 lower spontaneous calorie intake compared to the low-carb group. That's probably because the low-carb foods tend to be higher in fat, which are higher in calories. So after prioritizing protein, the second food group that affects weight loss the most is fiber. In many ways, fiber consumption is actually associated with greater weight loss than protein. But that's because most regular people don't really eat that much protein. And if they eat more fiber, they generally have lower BMIs. But for the sake of body composition optimization and maintaining muscle tissue and maintaining the weight loss, you also need to prioritize protein. I'm not counting how much fiber I eat, but it's recommended to get at least 30 grams of fiber per day which you can get from about five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. There's another factor of low-carb dieting that might backfire for weight loss. It's eating too much fat. Fat has nine calories per gram, which is more than twice of the four calories per gram of carbohydrates. Fat is important. We need healthy sources of fat, whole food fats, like pasture-raised eggs, avocados, things like that. When you start adding in what I call fat bombs, like heavy cream, you know, sticks of butter, low satiety, fairly low nutrient, dense and high calorie dense. And so you end up over consuming calories very easily because of that. A few cases, the ketogenic diets, which are more 80% fat work for certain people, but that's probably not the best diet for weight loss. It's more the moderate fat intake of 30, let's say 30 to 40% of your calories. And then you're getting, you know, somewhere between 30 and 40% of your calories from protein. And then somewhere between 10 to 20% of your calories from carbs. My own fat intake is around 20 to 25% of my total calorie intake. I get most of my fats from whole foods such as fish, eggs, meat, nuts, avocados, etc. I don't add any added fats because they're just going to be unnecessary calories and you don't need more than 15% of your total calories from fats to sustain hormone function and other essential processes in the body. I do take one teaspoon of C8 MCT oil in my coffee and I notice that it increases my metabolic rate. And I also take one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil with food. Let's talk a bit more specifically about exercise. When losing weight, you'll inevitably lose some muscle tissue because of the energy deficit. It's found that low calorie diets typically result in 75% fat loss and 25% lean body mass loss on both low carb and low fat diets. However, it is possible to minimize this. Exercise, especially resistance training, is the best way to do that. Resistance training while in calorie restriction makes the body keep more muscle and prioritize fat burning instead. Doing only aerobic exercise when in a calorie deficit without resistance training promotes further muscle catastrophe metabolism because it's a competing signal. By doing a lot of cardio and no weights, you signal the body that it doesn't need to have the muscle. And because of that, you start to lose the muscle because you're in a calorie deficit. And you might actually maintain the fat. As a result, you might end up becoming skinny fat and with a lower resting metabolic rate. By lifting weights, you prevent that. Resistance training also improves insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance. So resistance training is one of the most powerful ways to positively impact your body composition, making you build more muscle and making you burn more fat. If you want to learn my evidence-based muscle growth routine, then check out my previous video about the topic. Link in the description. This doesn't mean that cardio is bad, quite the opposite. For heart health and general longevity, then cardio is probably superior to weights. Doing extra cardio while dieting would make you lose weight faster by increasing your exercise activity thermogenesis. The catch is that cardio doesn't change your resting metabolic rate. You only burn calories while you're doing the cardio. Whereas when you build muscle, you increase your calorie expenditure when you're doing nothing. I obviously do both cardio and weights because both are needed for longevity. I train weights three times per week for 30 to 45 minutes each session and I do about two zone two cardio sessions lasting 45 minutes each per week. 
I also add one hit session that lasts for 20 to 30 minutes per week. But how do you keep the weight off? First, let's talk about what not to do. Extremely low calorie diets. The best example of this are weight loss TV programs. A 2016 study on the competitors of The Biggest Loser found that six years after the show, they had gained back 70% of the weight they initially lost. The biggest reason for weight regain is the fact that you can't eat extremely low calories and exercise hours every day forever. That's not sustainable, that kind of chronic restriction, and eventually Eventually you're going to break. To prevent that, you need to lose the weight more moderately and more slowly. It's been found that 20% calorie restriction and vigorous exercise for 20 minutes a day is enough to lose weight and keep it off. That's why all successful weight loss programs generally recommend a 20% calorie deficit instead of going into very extreme calorie deficits. A larger calorie deficit will make you lose the weight much faster, but the potential risk for rebounding is also much greater. Whatever your calorie intake is, whether you're trying to lose weight, gain weight or maintain weight, your body will adapt to it over time. It's called metabolic adaptation. Most of the decrease in metabolic rate during weight loss is the result of having less muscle and total body weight, which lowers your resting metabolic rate. For example, if a person who initially weighs 220 pounds or 100 kilos and they lose 50 pounds or 22 kilos, then their resting metabolic rate would presumably be a few hundred calories lower unless they build muscle while losing the fat, which isn't impossible, but highly unlikely. The reason your total daily energy expenditure declines during dieting is because of several reasons, such as loss of body weight, loss of muscle, lower NEAT, and less calories burned on digestion due to smaller calorie intake. So adaptive thermogenesis is a phenomenon where when your body isn't getting sufficient amount of calories, it will decrease movement and increase hunger. So your body's fighting against the weight loss. One way around that is to basically calorie cut cycle. The trial Matador looked at this and compared weight loss and fat loss using chronic caloric restriction versus cycling, you know, like we just talked about every one to two weeks. And there was much better fat loss with the calorie cycling, despite people being in a chronic calorie deficit. So in other words, it's not just about calories. And in fact, giving the body more calories at certain times will actually improve weight loss and fat loss. Continuing to exercise after the initial weight loss is associated with less weight regain. Higher protein and higher fiber diets are also linked to lower body weights and less weight regain. You have to also realize that the things that help you to lose the weight are also supposed to become a bigger part of your new lifestyle. You can't expect to eat the same diet that you used to or the same amount of calories as you used to and maintain your new body weight. Having a different body also means different habits and different dietary choices, at least in the quantities. Of course, you can have a cheat meal every once in a while or have a piece of cake at a birthday party, but you probably won't be able to keep the weight off by eating these foods every day. You don't have to be perfect 100% of the time, but you do have to be somewhat optimal the vast majority of the time. Not always, but the most of the time. So the obesity fix is really to give people the tools to lose weight sustainably and easily. It's real life tips. We talk about 85 different types of meal plans that people can do to um, lose weight, but we also go into hormones and nutrients and micronutrients that affect insulin sensitivity and fat gain as well. Social at Dr. James Dinek um, on Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitter, Facebook. All right, that's it for this video. Make sure you click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.